certainly the case. T1 will see what their answer is going to be. I mean, earlier today, they showed that they can very much beat the Yumi. I think the Poppy pick just generally very strong of Shiver dismounts anywhere near Poppy. She's dead. All the champions that Yumi wants to pair with want to dash anyway. So we'll see if that's going to be the priority. Maybe it's something that DFM try to proactively take away. I mean, my assumption is they'll probably just go Leona on three. I think that Leona has been another really highly prized support. Uh, does give them the ability to engage. Going double AD carry in their one, two. You're expecting this to be Graves top for Kana. Uh, of course, you do have the other option of just going a more defensive route and going an Enchanter to match the laning power of Yumi. Exactly, and, and it'll at least give them pressure through bot lane. I'm um, expecting that to be a Lulu on three, because uh, they definitely don't want that to be taken away. The Thresh is available. Karia is a great Thresh player, so that is an option if they just want to play directly to bot lane. See what the options are going to be. I really just generally like the Yumi Jin pairing, though. Jin, obviously so strong on his own, wants to sit in the back line anyway and kind of rain down a little bit more poke, soften them up before the fight starts. So it does free up Yumi to be more focused on those, uh, those Bruiser-style champions. But who are they going to pick to pair with this Yumi so effectively? The Zoe... Oh. Not what we normally look for, but now a lot of poke on the side of DFM. They have actually just so much poke. Huge range advantage at this point. Have to see how they can utilize it. Yeah, I'm not surprised with the Lulu being hovered, but that's an Arya special. That's been his best champion uh, domestically and at this tournament. So not surprised that in what feels like your final game, you want to show your best self and putting yourself on uh, the, uh, the, the Zoe. I think it got a good call. The stage now heading into the ban phase, though. Lulu picked up. Karia and Gumiusi uh, set up to dominate the bottom side of the map if they get going. Always difficult to take down Nefelios when he's paired with this Lulu. Yeah, the Talon ban, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I called it out earlier. Steel had actually had a really good game against EDG. It wasn't a loss, but uh, really was a standout player for them. And that pairing alongside Yumi is something that Owner and Karia also showed uh, really can be very, very powerful. You can also look towards the top lane ban. Evie has been getting Urgot banned against him all the time. They already have their top laner, and we're expecting DFM to just ban away mid laners here to try to protect Faker. Yeah, I would have expected a perfect composition for DFM to be Jace and Zin. Good thing that Zin was banned, but they can still find a jungler that can fill that position just as a frontliner, just because you're gonna have a pretty uh, uh, poke pick type of composition on the side of DFM, so still a few things available. Taking their time on this final ban from the side of DFM, have to be careful about what they pick here. Really pondering the options. The J4 are going to be the one that comes out. Makes a lot of sense. A lot of immobile carries so far from what we've seen on the side of DFM. Yeah, and, and I also think that, honestly, T1 needs some sort of engage, right? You know, they can play it a little bit slower, a little bit kite back, but, like, Graves generally wants someone to engage for him to set him up. Uh, not going to get baited by the hover, but it would be cool. Season 3. Flashbacks? Oh, okay. okay. Also Season 3, but, like, every okay. season less spicy. Yeah. Well... Now, now if it's Orianna, I feel like for sure owner's going to go to for some sort of an engage. You generally want setup for this. You're playing double AD carry with two shielding champions. You want some sort of a front line that can actually create space so that they can move forward. And I wonder what we're going to see here coming out as the answer to Kana in the top lane. Not Can't say I would be a fan of Renekton. Renekton just feels so weak on this patch, but it is oh. going to be Renekton. And now, unless you draft something that's like dominating in jungle, I just don't see how you can really punish the Grave. Do they just send Grave's jungle and immediately slap a cannon top down? One of Kana's best picks. Picked it a ton pretty much every time it was open. It could. It's, yeah. I, I just think compositionally, you end up with a bit of a weird space, right? Like sure. Because you don't have any, any sort of real engage on T1. Doesn't mean that they couldn't just blow you out in the laning phase and win like that, but... Uh, it does feel a little bit harder. And oh, the Shaco. The Shaco. Oh. Okay. I think this is, he actually brought this out in the LJL a number of times. I want to say, I don't have the stat great to mind, but I want to say it's something like 4-0. Like Marcus played, played, played it the stat. a significant Four amount of times, times insane. in the Four LJL. Four times confirmed. Thank you, Marcus. Wow. And and he also drew bans in the LJL. So this is not a, actually a troll pick. This is not a like, ah, it's our last game in the world. Ta -ha. It's actually a real pick. It is respected in the LJL. And it's very exciting. I think throwing a curveball like this makes a lot of sense. And for me, just instantly looking at the mid lane, uh, you want to be able to get flash off of Faker on the Orianna and, and set Arya up to succeed. I, I believe that has to be the strategy. Either way, look towards your top side of the map and getting Evi and Arya ahead. So owner goes for the Kiana. That is going to be their, their way to get things started. Send it to Kiana, you know, paired up with the Orianna to deliver you know, that shockwave follow-up potentially. It is a very squiffy composition here on T1. Going to have to kite out the initial engage you know, from the champions like the Shaco, like the Renekton, like the Yumi. But if you can actually back off 
they have so much damage coming through that the front line is going to get roasted from DFM. And you have an Aphelios with an Orion and a Lulu standing next to yeah. him. You've got a Graze with an Orion and a Lulu standing yeah. next to him. He's going to be very fast. He's going to be very hard to kill if those initial cooldowns do not finish him off. That being said, if you can get ahead here as DFM, and that is a big if because T1's early game is legendary, you can run over these types of squishy compositions. You find an engage from ahead, everyone can start to crumble on the T1 side. That's why I'm interested in the first clear here for Steel, because if you can get a, a flash through mid lane or change up timings on the top side of the map, so now, sure, Graves, who's been throughout the tournament running rough shot top lane, getting pushed it off, uh, try, just picking up uh, plates on turret, then great. You have a Renekton that's rolling. You have a play around Dragon, uh, uh, maybe even a TP uh, advantage. So really interested to see what Steel's pathing is. I'm also interested to see if T1's actually going to invade Shaco because a lot of Shakos, you know, really do kind of depend on the early box setup to have a super fast clear, especially um, some Shakos do the like boxes at multiple camps, yeah. right? You know, trying to really Welcome accelerate the clear speed. Uh, and in a lot of organized plays, people will actually just do a strong invade as long as they're confident they're level one to try to just pop the boxes back out and really slow down the Shaco's clear. You can see Karia hovering. Has Gumiusi in the area. Yeah, it's a line of scrimmage, though. I don't think that they are looking to do it. And this first Shaco box is actually really smart because if T1 were to invade, they at least have this one to try to defend. It's going to spot them out if they step too far forward. Swept and taken down. But now they can be reasonably sure that Shaco is starting on the top side or at least not able to start multiple camps as they've cleared Raptors. Maybe he is on red. Maybe he's on top side. They're not 100% certain. You can even see here on top side Kana just walking yeah. in just to get any vision on if he could see Shaco. And this is actually pretty smart. So I, I think they basically anticipated it. He puts one defensive box over by the red buff to just cover the invade. And then two boxes here on wolves. So he's actually not starting a buff. You know, he is, is, is potentially starting there on the wolves. Uh, to just actually circumvent this. And he'll drop a third box over at the blue. So he'll clear the wolves, he'll move up to the blue, pull the blue back into that box, have his cooldown up for potentially another, and try to really accelerate that clear while making it safe from the invade. Uh, thankfully, T1 will still be able to get to see what side of the map he's starting on, of course. Yep. Late Ward being put down by Kana, so should recognize Steel's going to be looking for bot side, maybe even challenging for bot scuttle, so owner will be uh, ready for that. But you can also see the comparison between a Shaco and a leashless Kiana jungle start. The pace, obviously, very much in favor of the Shaco early on. Has Ignite as well, so see how Steel wants to play this. Uh, if you've played solo queue ever in your life, you know how miserable it is to be ganked by a Shaco. Mm -hmm. Very impressive champion early in the game. And with Hail of Blades here as well, the early game power pretty high. You know, I am expecting it to be an AD Shaco, uh, so it'll be interesting to see exactly where he wants to go. If he's going to go straight towards Mythic, if he's going to go Ghost Blade, which we've seen a lot of Lethality champions rushing towards, or even something you know more like an Umbral Glaive to control vision. He's pinging this top side, and so good thing Kano is able to get that ward off, so he can just back away from the wave and play as safely as possible. It makes it so now Owner knows that he can play for this mid lane uh, for Scottle, but Faker. There you go. Going in, is immediately going to get the flash out to show oh, poison on wow. top of that big early damage. I love that. He didn't even use the ignite. It's so common to see people just autopilot on that, press the ignite on their first gank. But he forces the flash without using it, and now could run into owner here, and he would have ignite advantage, but owner does have red buff and steel does not. Be difficult. Is he going to go for the play? If he baits him into the box, it should be yeah. decent setup. Backstab going to be important here, but good ward from owner just to make sure he has been yeah. the entire time. And just take a look at the bot lane. He, you're going to have Gumi Yusi and Peria moving up because they've had Pyo now. So even with the work Steel's been putting down, going to be pushed off of Scuttlecraft. And I got to say, while Faker did have to burn Flash there, and it's been a solid early game. Hold that lead. dot, Aria. Going forward. Big damage. Finished oh! it first blood and Faker! This man does not stop. Last game was the Twisted Fate show. Even Ooh. though it was a loss, he comes out and he first bloods Faker 1v1. Back to back games. Arya is showing up and they're TP top. top. Zoe now coming in as well. Evie now dashing through, stacking up the rage, has Conqueror proc. Not going to be able to see him in the smoke screen, but now they're stepping forward. Khan is going to be in trouble dashing into the bush, but Arya can just walk forward. He doesn't have enough health. Arya taking his time on this one. This man is out of his mind. Two kills already. Crown this man. Insane start from Arya, and really smart from Evie to just play around the minion wave so Graves couldn't even get a return kill there. And I honestly did not think I would need to use this graphic today, but here we go. Let me remind you 
that we are expecting 5-1-5-1 tiebreaker end of the day. We want to complete the EDG T1 best of three. That's what the people are waiting for. But DFM, they're looking to get one win on the board. If they get that one win over T1, EDG beating 100 Thieves, and unless 100 Thieves also beat EDG, that's EDG out in first, SKT out in second, T1 rather. Yeah, I mean, that, that'd be a huge win. I, I will say Steel's clear has been incredibly slowed down. You know, they were playing so heavily around that bot scuttle, and he still had all three bot side camps available. He now did get his red, but he lost his Krugs. Looks like he's going to lose his Raptors here as well. And we can watch this one more time, just walking straight up, using the cleanse for the move speed, auto into the sleep, backs out of turret range, and then the paddle star around the minions, plus the empowered auto, the stolen flash to bounce right back out. That is clean from Absolutely. Aria. Absolutely. Owner now stepping forward, though, on the bottom side. They're going to have to respect it on the side of DFM. Already one play getting taken down. Remember, Shaco was the crazy variable. Aria certainly coming out as well, something T1 might not have been ready for. But otherwise, across the map, it really is a full court press. Mid lane really the only strong point right now for DFM. Faker potentially in trouble here. Two-shoot poison. Don't follow up auto attack. Yeah, just out of fog there. And just as a reminder, Shaco is not seen if he queues in fog anymore. So still a positive thing for Shaco players there where no flash on Baker, just losing uh, 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 HP off of these ganks. And you can see Evie's trying to hold the wave, but this always gets a little bit dicey when you're already kind of low on health. You yeah. know, he's trying to make it feel risky for Kana. Kana's so healthy, uh, and he does have a ward in the river. And until you actually have levels on, on Shaco, like, you can't just queue over the wall and get all the way into lane. So he's, he's feeling pretty safe. And I, I do think that Evie overplayed his hand. When you really try to freeze into a heavy wave like that, you take so much harass. And unless the jungler is there immediately to punish, it doesn't get you anything. And in this case, T1 is actually looking to dive instead. Unless Evie hits six, he's in danger. Oh, the whip. Kind of just hit level six. Ulti going wide is big. Owner can now step forward. Waterblade, if he double dashes to the way, will he hit six? Wants to clear it, is immediately going to hit six. Is immediately now going to ult. He's holding on and he's moving back. That's Owner's flash gone. Steel now on the way in. Ignite coming in from the invisible Shaco. Will now be revealed. Kana holding the line though, playing with confidence. That was actually really well played. Evie dashing into the wave, killing just enough minions to get six. They get two flashes off that for just the ulti and the ignite. And Steel also just backing them up there was on Grom and in position in case that was happening. So they didn't feel concerned about it. But yeah, it led, it started with Evie taking a bad trade. But in the end, able to defend him. Yeah, Evie now going to push this wave in. Kana backing off. Looks like they are going to fish for the collapse here. Steel, of course, has already backed Evie. Right when we praise him, it might be a little bit too late, but there's no CC here, and that means he should be able to make it out. Unless they've got oh! the burst damage, barely. Ooh. Oh, yikes. That actually hurts. I thought he was at least keeping to base, so he would have been back to base quicker, but does get out. Uh, unfortunately, means his, his recall is going to be pretty delayed as yeah. he was just TPing to that tier two. Uh, but either way, does escape. And maybe Steel needed to stay around a little bit longer, but I think they made the read. Kana's really low. They both just flashed. They expected T1 to have reset. They stay out on the map for a longer time there. They do get out the TP. So now I'm seeing T1 stabilizing, and a lot of it's based off of Gumiyushi and Karia. Uh, earlier on, they were able to threaten dive, push Gang and Yudapon off the wave, and so they're behind. And they've been at under turret for quite some time, so maybe Steel can upset that he is positioning for a gang. Visible has a Yumi attached to him. That's an obnoxious combo. Gumiyushi, though, with the sidestep exhaust immediately coming out, and he's firing back. Polymorph on the Shaco. Very squishy champion. Ulti now coming in. He is not scared of that Shaco. Instant turn to burn from Gumiyushi. Perfect guns, perfectly played. If Yudapon was able to get that snare on Gumiyushi, that would have changed a little bit more. But man, what a great response from them and Karia to get the kill back. Yeah, it's all about the sidestep from Gumiyushi there. Just beautifully played by him, dodging the Jin W. And as soon as that comes down, Steel knows that he can't actually close the gap, so he's immediately retreating. But he is not six. His farm has been very slow here. You can see he's a number of camps actually behind Owner, who already is six. Uh, so you don't have a lot of defensive tools there. When you use the Q in, no way to really get out. Yeah, and it's getting worse and worse here. Just taking a look at this now uh, on the setup. I like the idea because T1 would be in position for a dragon, as you can see, uh, with owner in the river. But yeah, they turn it on their head, able to get enough damage, Ignite also uh, pinging so they can get the kill on towards Shaco. Now looking towards Rift Herald. And the thing is, if you make a single misstep in that gank, you are guaranteed to die. He had no ammo on two guns, which means he gets to cast four abilities in the space of half a second, and he might get to do it again. Steel now running. Evie now going forward, just wants to focus his kill on Kana, and he's going to grab at least one. Fury not stacked quite yet. Steel has to be careful on this one. Level 6 has the ultimate and can use it, but the Yumi will reveal who the real one is. Still, the clone Shaco going in. The Renekton locked into the wall. The Shaco locked up anyway. Karia can backstep, but now they're going in. It's a fear coming out. Evie will go down. Utapon stepping forward. Faker, no mana in the area. Ari 
Arya is here, four shot available. The Gumi is just gonna start to walk it down. DFM, scrappy fight on the top side. Yeah, DFM did not expect everyone from TM to be there, or T1 to be there, rather. As the bot lane was already there, when Steel jumps over the wall and Gumiushi and Carrie are waiting for him, they were not ready for that, but Evi does get the solo kill on Nakana, so not bad whatsoever. Yeah, the setup happened during the replay. It looks like now Steel's looking for another play on you, Gumiushi. But in the end, T1, their aim was Rift Herald. They can still go towards it. They're keeping their bot side up in the top lane. And so it's going to be pretty difficult for Detonation Focus Me to kind of try to stop them. Here they are. Oh, very high stakes to go into it. Belios. He's got all the guns that he needs. He's going in. He's healing up. What are you doing? This is when the champion is the strongest. You just walked right into melee range. Your red gun, white gun, <laughs> and a Lulu right next to you. Uh, Steel learned that one the hard way. Red, white, don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um... Yeah, that was a math test, and DFM did not pass. Um, they didn't have the calculator. Nope. It's hard without the old Red TI-83. Red plus white equals gray. That's the math on <laughs> that <is>. one. <laughs> <laughs> you hate to see it happen. You do hate to see it. T1 now pushing in the mid lane. Their lead steadily growing. Yes, some strong individual moments from the side of DFM. Arya now fishing in for oh. big damage. And while that looks good, the 2K gold deficit certainly does not. That's true. But if you squint, you could only see what was happening in the middle of the screen. You'd be like, ah, <laughs> DFM's doing great. If nice. we highlighted it like one of those Chinese TikToks where you can't see the scoreboard whatsoever, yes. just a little right there, it would have been perfect. Ooh, Baker. So, Shaco definitely not working out so far. I mean, I mean, it's it's tough, honestly. You know, you're playing essentially an like what works as an assassin here, kind of. Uh, and every time he's going in against Kara, he has to use the Q to actually get in. But then when that's on cooldown, he just gets polymorphed immediately, and he's getting exploded during the polymorph pretty much every single time. Uh, really starting to actually struggle, both to keep up in farm and to actually really get anything done in these plays. That's why I want them to use Arya a little bit more. Um, a lot of the times they think they're strong enough to be able to just come in as a trio. Uh, knowing that owner is back in base, or earlier on in the game, knowing that owner was in the opposite side of the map. But just use his strong point in the map. He's been doing really well here, and now they're trying to make that happen. Okay, damage, but while we all know what it feels like to play against a fed Shaco, you might not recognize what a behind Shaco does, and it is very little. Yeah, I mean, Steel is so unthreatening. Like, you have to kill Gumiyushi to do anything. Gumiyushi's playing with Exhaust. He has Carrier behind him on the Lulu. He has a full shield bow completed, and it's a phage pickaxe. You know, there's just, there's no threat whatsoever from Steel. So at this point, T1 should feel confident to just show up to objectives, start taking them, and make DFM come to you. It really is just going to be the Gumiyushi show. Of course, all of T1, though, looking relatively strong. You can see Faker still mid lane pressure, still getting plates, but he's going to go tabby, he's going to go collector, and he's going to one-shot you. He's not going to need to auto-attack. He will just push abilities. Yeah, and once again, Utapon and Gang have to leave this turret. This free turret plates there, going over to Gumiyushi and Karia. And yeah, Rift Herald being placed. This is something that T1 can just do on repeat. Regardless of where Gumiyushi and Karia are sitting, they can just consistently play around this strongest piece, and it's working out well for them. See the struggle for Steel. It's just going to take a lot of time to clear that out. Arya flashing through, trying to outplay Faker. Faker flashing over the wall, however. Portal jump, where's it going to go? Second Herald charge on the bottom side. Arya desperate to finish the kill, but will not find another 1v1. Has a stolen flash. Faker forced to retreat, so Arya should be able to trade a little bit of something back. And I've got to say, Yes, it's very clearly looking like it's going one way at this point, but Arya has played like such a monster today. He is truly showing that he is world class. He absolutely gapped Avadaga last game. He's gotten the kill and he's gotten the pressure on Faker this game. Yes, he got some help from Shaco, uh, but he is playing so well today. Definitely is. Warner's gonna do what he can to catch the experience and the wave and. T1 just steadily pulling ahead. Again, small moments, good moments from DFM, but sadly the Shaco really shut down in the early game, makes it feel like it's gonna be so hard for them to, to get anything done to stop T1's steadily snowballing gold. Yeah, they have to do something about Kana here. I say that as Gumiyushi and Carrier are back in the top lane to back him up and get this top turret. Uh, but he's just been a beast throughout the tournament, having the highest CS uh, differential, and overall has been getting a lot of draft resources. The Graves has been a real power piece for him. He's also getting a lot of owner resources yep. up there in that <laughs> top lane. I think the difficult part too now is they just keep sending him to different lanes. He used farming. He's pulling ahead of the Renekton despite having two deaths already. And now Gumiusi, they're just using him as a strong point, rotating around the map, breaking down all these towers. Is he going to get the plate before 14 minutes? No. No, he is not. Yep, well, they did take that tower down. 
the lead really growing here now, 4T1. The Chemtech Future Fire is done for Caria. 2,000 gold lead there on the AD. 1,500 on supports. There's nothing to sneeze at either. And I mean, really, it's becoming very difficult. The only one who has a lead is Aria. And it's it's small enough that it's it's going to be difficult for him to make anything happen. Yeah, and if you take a look at the that top side jungle here, just great amount of vision control there for T1. And there's a, t a ton of gold being uh, put on this second tier turret. So right now, the them have to try for a play, and it looks like it's going to be on Kana. Kana now backing off. That's the Shaco clone, but instantly going to see that deleted. And now suddenly, there's a Kiana running. He's going to get caught out by the sleep. Aria not going to turn back and try to fire again. Steel waiting in the darkness, but he's just forced to recall. T1 really not scared of DFM whatsoever. But that's the benefit here from having so much vision in the top side is that they didn't see them cutting through the, the top lane straight to the jungle. And now they're going to have first touch of this turret. So great job from T1 overall making use of Gamushi. I mean, they just know they're so insanely far ahead. You just send Gamushi up, start hitting the tower. Oriana and Lulu stand behind you. What are they going to do? Their wave clear isn't strong enough. They can't actually walk up to them and fight them either. So there's bleeding towers left and right here. They got both up in that top lane. They move mid. They take that. Uh, and T1 really starting to run away with this one. And I just don't even know who the Shaco Yumi combo can kill. You look at this combo without the, the, the item screen, and you go, that must be lethal. That's two ignites. That's an exhaust on top of a chilling smite, a Shaco with Halo Blades. But then you take into account where they are relative to the opposing team. It's just so underwhelming. I mean, I, th I think that there's a few people that they could kill if they can catch them out, you know, away from a tower and in a 2v1. But the problem is T1 is grouping up constantly. They're not overextending in these lanes. Yeah. You know, if you catch Faker or, or even Kana, you know, overextending the lane, you could probably run them down. But T1 is never giving you the opportunity. They're always within the same quadrant as each other. So you just have to live a couple seconds and you're going to have backup. And that has been the case every single time. And since the early mistakes there from Faker just being picked out, I mean, he's been playing really safe and playing around phase rush and flash. So he doesn't have flash right now. He's not putting himself in a bad position. So TP coming through. Forward, secret trouble bubble not going to connect. Rather, Paddle Star will not connect now. Trying to burn down Kana. Immortal Shield Bow proc. They will find the kill. It takes them a lot of resources, but T1, not a lot for them to take on the top side. Well, Harold just fine, so never mind. I take that back. Yeah, jungle camps being taken down. I mean, at this point, they're just going to try and at least chip at this mid lane inner while Rift Herald is being placed here. And with how much vision that they have on the map right now, they could actually just say, we're not going to base, we're just going to use Rift Herald now, and then bounce between both mid and top lane and just choose with uh, one has the biggest wave. And I, mean, I think part of the difficulty here as well for DFM wasn't already hard enough is that because Yumi has just been paired up with Steel for so long now, Unipon has kind of been hung out to drive, right? He can't actually really move forward. He has to deal with this potential Kiana. There's always Gumiushi and Karia stuck together as a duo. So he's just kind of getting scraps and falling further and further behind this insanely fed Felios. Definitely an incredibly difficult map state. DFM, respect for fishing for the opportunities, finding that, but it only gets harder. Again, as the Graves gets more items under his belt, you can see he's starting to work towards a VT now at this stage of the game. And the man who's going to be unkillable, I think, for the rest of the game, short of a miracle inside of DFM, is the Muse. You see it now. Collector finished. He's the Conqueror Lethality of Felios. This is so, so oppressive if it gets a lead. Yeah, it's, he's huge right now. So next fight, I would imagine it to be around Dragon. Don't think DFM can really take a fight on that one. They're pinging topside turret, and I believe that's just the right decision. Um, just try and trade across the map. And if we're just talking about the support jungle duo, it seems like Kana's going to be needing some defense. Shockwave to delete the wave. You like it? Steal. Let's get the ulti down. Faker isolated to the side. They are going to be able to break down mid tier one, but it looks like at the cost of bot tier two, maybe even tier three, if the Herald can get a second charge. It's going to get a second charge for sure. They haven't even started their recalls until just now. So it's going to be a while. I don't think that they'll be able to finish it off, but T1 is just going mid. They're going to push up that as well. So they're going to try to threaten multiple tier twos at the same time here. And again, the gold lead is extending further and Got further, it. and they will get that tier three. Now the wave is set up in the mid lane as well. DFM, maybe they try to go for the fight here, but the tower getting lower and lower. Evie going to dash in. Is going to get some good damage down with the Gore Drinker as well, but it's just going to get popped. Has the ultimate, has the Gore Drinker, but it's not nearly enough. Red, white, definitely time for DFM not to fight to back away. <laughs> it's getting depressing really quickly, Dracos. Yeah. It's getting to that point. Evie uh, busting out of his suit to see if he can start a fight, anything for his team. 
But yeah, uh, I, I said trade, got Rift Herald was a thing, so really good decision from T1 to just say, well, we have vision in the bottom side jungle. We can just literally uh, bounce from bottom and hip turret, mi mid inner turret, and now DFM is just struggling to find anything on the map. This is brutal. They got a Gromp. They got a Gromp. Not I started the books. game, I saw two kills for the Zoe, and I believed in a miracle. <laughs> and that belief is being slowly choked out of me by a Gigafet of Felios <laughs> and all of T1. And this is why they are currently fighting with EDG for first seed. And again, how much they have stepped up. We saw the first game versus EDG, they got absolutely blasted. It was not even remotely close. EDG playing to a T, second time around, clean things up, playing a lot better. And we are now poised, if 100 Thieves can't make the upset, for the game three, the rematch, the tiebreaker. And this was kind of always the story of T1 in the past, at previous Worlds. They ramp up throughout the tournament, get better and better. They've always been so adept at learning from their mistakes, at adjusting to the meta, at finding their niche within those powerful picks. And when they do, they are so tough to beat, especially because their early game is just so ridiculous this year. They've such an incredibly skilled roster of players, and now starting up this Baron. Steel gonna have to live up to his name. 5K getting lower. Jaco Smite, level 10. Can he get it? 4K, they don't have vision on it. 3K. T1 wanna flip it, they're ready. Are they just gonna hold it at 3.5? They're not autoing the Baron. Yes, now they are again. 2.8, taking their time. Evi off to the side, just trying to bait the fight. It looks like they're gonna find one with the ulti. Evi now getting pulled up, using his ultimate as well. Kumiyoshi backing up the Baron, but the Baron, they're still leashing it. They're still holding on to that point. Oh, they're almost one shot. Curtain call now coming out. T1 really trying to force DFM to come into them, trying to bait a mistake, but DFM playing it slow, not really giving much up. That was the best thing they're done by DFM, and now they're pivoting for a fight. Arya's coming from a flank. It's gonna be easy to land the bubble. Bubble coming through, now Faker gonna be locked up, forced to flash away, now Arya stepping forward, looks like a creep gonna tank that one, pretty massive, Faker still rooted, steal off to the side, but the Shaco not too menacing, DFM forcing T1 back, but it doesn't look like they're gonna be able to get much else. Not able to do anything really besides get them off the Baron, because again, T1 just kites it out, they stay together as this squad, Arya poking away as much as he can, but there's no real threat of a counter Baron on DFM side either. Yeah, and I just like what DFM did as a response because Owner was the one that was sitting in a flank spot looking for a fight. He didn't want to be in the pit. He wanted to force DFM's hand to put themselves in a position where they had to fight. But Steel was right behind the pit. No one trying to push him off. Looking for another kill on a Faker. That was a close one. Yeah. The bubble going through the wall and off the map. That had connected. You have to feel like Faker would have dropped. The paddles are also very, very close there. You got to respect taking those swings here. Arya knows it's a long shot to come back in this game, but you've got to find picks if you want to have any hope whatsoever. But T1 just focusing so much on vision control. Look at all the sweepers they've got. They've got the Umbo Glaive here as well on owner, you know, going more for the vision control, vision denial, just trying to shut EFM out of this game. And that's been the strength of T1 in this group. They have the highest support jungle proximity. A lot of the time, vision is nailed down by owner and Karia. They've done a great job at it, and it's surprising for such a young roster, of course, specifically uh, looking at owner being that rookie this year with Gumayushi. So really good look for the team. You said that they were skilled, and it looks like they have the fundamentals down packed. Very crucial. And it feels like we're kind of just on this collision course for the tiebreaker. At the end of the day, of course, there is the chance that DFM can make something happen or that 100 Thieves can potentially pull off a miracle. But given any any sort of you know upset, nothing like that happens. It is going to be T1 versus EDG meeting for that first place seed. And EDG, despite being the LPL number one four times now, have never come out of groups number one. They always come out in second place. They always seem to fall short at Worlds, and T1 is looking to try to make that happen here once more. INTZ tiebreaker. Got H2K out in first seed. Thank you, INTZ. Uh, part of the 2016 run. C, BDG can make just a small bit of history today by taking T1 down in the tiebreaker, but of course, one game at a time. For now, Steel locked up, has to play careful. Of course, Yumi is getting stronger. She does have the Ludens Echo completed, so isolated members of T1 are still very much uh, vulnerable, but when they play, it's kind of this death ball. It's so hard to get through both the Orianna and the Lulu shielding. Yeah, they're gonna have to go back there. I guess the blue trinket is being hidden by the control ward, but ultimately, wow, that's a lot of damage on Award's owner. They just wanted to play with time there, knowing that Graves was just threatening down bot lane. No one was responding to him. Now Renekton is going down there, but 
I think uh, T1's doing a good job playing it respectfully, and now they should just start up. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, they're going to try to force here. I mean, they have no engage, so they can't really pick a lot of their fights. The only way to get fights is to actually go to the Baron, but then they have no tank, so the Baron is somewhat dangerous. They're relying on these shields, and DFM trying to get in here to stop them, but it is going down fast. You know? Leaping out, heavy off to the side. It doesn't look like they're going to be able to get into the pit. Can they do it? Steal. Can he find the Miracle? He ults, but that just means he does not have time to land the smite. DFM now trying to force the fight in the meantime. Gumiyushi on the backside, but he has not taken any damage yet. Red, white, do not fight. Do not take this one. Gumiyushi finding a kill onto the Shaco in the meantime. All of DFM Ryan running. Yudapon got the four shot and the extra movement speed. Arya trying to lay down some damage from downtown, but Ebi just going into the meat grinder and getting chewed up. Owner can leap forward with the water blade in a moment. Two members, three members of DFM left standing as they back away, but T1 with the Baron can push in for so much more. Gumiyushi, oh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> Okay, I see you. Oh, Owner that's Faker. Is Hello, styling. Faker. Here we are. Hello. Faker TP. Aria fishing for one more kill. Won't be a solo kill, but goes golden. Connor there to body block the ball up Paddle Star. And T1 just marching down mid lane. They've got a Baron empowered wave. It might be enough to end the game, but Steel coming back. It feels like instead it will just be two quick inhibitors picked up. Hey, they want to go for it. At least Connor's just trying to pressure that one turret. But yeah, uh, just take a look at this. It's just insane. Gumiyushi unkillable. Doesn't need to use his sums on that one. On one side, and on the other hand, Owner are looking from a flank, and that's just been what Owner has been doing throughout this game. Has been really creative with the vision that they do have. And taking out this uh, Axe Effect replay here, DFM wanted to push in. A great call to use ulti just to stun up the members of DFM so they don't have a chance to steal. Yeah, and then it's all about the shockwave from here. As the three members of PFM try to axe it out, Faker finds him as he has so many times before. No chance for them to get in. No chance for them to get away. And Faker again. Unlocked up. Faker taking his time with this one. Clockwork wind up and a command attack. Going to finish that kill off. Steel running. He's invisible, but T1 are still hunting him down anyway. On the chase. Whimsy does come out. T1 feels like all but certain victory. Looking for... Really miracles, true, actual, honest-to-goodness miracles at this point for DFM is T1 now pushing on the top side and are set to end the game. Yeah, and it's going to be a tough one for DFM overall. Really hard not being able to find that win, but a great showcase of their talent. Arya has been a real great star, but they have to draw the line in the sand somewhere. One last fight. Heavy ulting, they can see that one coming. Steel going invisible. Faker potentially off to the side, but no, Gumiyushi still. Finding these kills left and right. Doesn't matter what guns he has anymore. He's just too far ahead. All of T1 now collapsing on the Nexus. Going for a few more cheeky kills. Why not? They've got the time. And it is certainly their game. But absolute dominance here from T1. Made no mistake about it. T1 grabbed their fifth win of the group stage here. And now will be guaranteed at the very least the tiebreaker for first. They become 100 Thieves fans, see if they can knock out EDG, save them a little time at the end of the day. But if that does not happen, we are going to be having that tiebreaker between T1 and EDG, who has been getting ramped up here in week two. Yeah, and T1 is just a scary team. Jungle, top lane have been a real force in this tournament. And owner on is Kiana. This is a great showcase of just his creativity, as I mentioned, a great playmaker. They don't have to start and flip around objectives. They just want to force those fights, and their team fights have been crisp. And I think the thing that I really love from the side of T1 yeah. is that, not, I mean, Kumi Yushi, obviously, you have so many individual performers. But in this game, Shaco, obviously not something you're probably scrimming against, not something you see a ton. Yeah. You played against in solo queue. Despite that, the team reacted so well. That little ward on the top side for Kana, very big difference. The confidence to move in, getting bot prio, contesting the crabs. And while, yes, maybe there's some arguments that Steel could have played it differently, I think the one unknown element, this Shaco pick, they played so well around. Yeah, I mean, they played very well around the wing conditions of their opponents, trying to lock them down, trying to cover their bases, make sure that they weren't able to snowball. And then honestly, from there, it just felt like it's a, it's a skill difference, right? T1 are so adept at the team fight, so adept in 